Here's a twig. Look, I put the twig back in so they can not say that I've been naughty. Okay. I'll turn away. Matthew, what are you doing here, Matthew? I like to film bunkers. I've got a YouTube channel called The Secret Vault. Okay. Well, it's a really gorgeous morning as we're driving off to the bunker in High Wycombe. We're going to High Wycombe to the girls' school today. Oh dear, yes. Now they're running tours that you can pay for. But rather than let me in and let me film, they said, no, you can't film. In a quarter of a mile, turn right onto A342. They said, you can't film. And I'd made an arrangement that I would come and I thought I'd be allowed to film and I would take down my video, my embarrassing video of them and their antics. Turn away. So, yeah, uh, they the chose. Right onto A342. They chose to say no. You can't. You can't film. So, subsequently, uh, I didn't come, and now they're running tours. So I'm going to pay and come and film, and I've still got my video up. How stupid is that? Continue how, on A342 for four miles. How stupid is that? I've still got my video up and I'm paying to come and look at it now. Yeah, right. But are they going to pull any stunts? Now that's the thing. I'm fully expecting it. I'm fully expecting them to pull some stunts today and possibly not let me go in just to go ha 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 to me. But that isn't going to be very good, is it, if they do that? That's going to be a bit spiteful. But let's see. I live in hope. I live in hope that we're not going to get any aggro, but what a nice day with the sun rising. Look, so let's just reflect on the wonder of the sun rising as I'm going off to my fate at the girls' school, <coughs> also known as Dawes Hill Bunker, United States Air Force. Yeah. school. Oops a daisy. Oh, sorry, I saw the sign to the bunker tour. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Do you know there, where right? to go? I don't know. All right, if you follow the road round to the left, yep. down to the end, you see the cars in the distance? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the Oversfield car park. Okay. And it's all signposted. Uh, you haven't by any chance got a toilet, or is there one in it, here? All, it's all up there, so. All right, brilliant. All right. Okay, thank you very no much. Cheers. So far, is it going to last though? And how many people are going to be on this tour? That's quite nice. Nice fire. I was going to say, that's quite nice. There. What's this look? Isn't that quite nice and pretty? Yee. But we're not here for that. We're here for bunker tour. I'm just going to restart my bloody phone. Doing madness like that. There's quite a few cars up here. Look. Hmm. So I'll get my camera out, set it all up, and we go for a nice old walk. There are Junior's house and Dawes Hill. It says up there, Junior's house and Dawes Hill, to the right. So, 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 cars. So, yeah. We're going to do the walk of shame in a minute, which is going to be all the way up that hill towards where we were <laughs> that fateful night, which actually probably caused this... Oh. Caused this um, whole place to be more accessible. I think it was because... I think it was because of something we did. Being a naughty boy. What do you reckon? Do you think it was because of us? Right, so... Close the, close the car up. And... It's time to do the walk up to the bunker. Let's have a little look around here then. What we got? Right, we got a nice school down there. Ah, and this is the walk up to the bunker. And um, in my video, the top of this hill here is kind of where I got to when I was um, when I was basically sort of sussed out by the uh, security. So that's that's kind of where I'd actually got to. So. So So uh, hopefully they've got a toilet up here. And time is 22 minutes past 10 and it's actually on in uh, eight minutes. So we've arrived just on just at the right time. So had I come down the hill, this is what I would have encountered. This house here on site. And oh look, it says bunker tour. There we are, look. Wickham Abbey bunker tour. How nice of them. <laughs> It's amazing what you've got to go through in it to get a tour of a bunker. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, at least at the end of the day, it has now been properly opened up for people to look at. I don't know how many of these they're going to do in the future, but we shall see. the driveway up to the, to the actual bunker which was hidden away on the school grounds. Which is kind of funny, isn't it, you know? USAF hiding a bunker up behind the school. Certainly are a lot of cars up here. I wonder why we couldn't have just parked up here. Goodness gracious. Could be because these are cars belonging to the uh, Estates Department. <sighs> I'm absolutely knackered. <sighs> Hurt in my chest, this is. Remember, the, remember this place? I remember this place at night. And over there are the entrances. Just down there, on the right hand side where that bloke with the phone is. Hi there, all right. Yeah, not too bad. I'm Barney, I'm full of you. All right, cool man. Yeah. 
Excellent, oh, look. Oh, oh. Go, go, somebody recognise this. In. What's that, sorry? Winch it in. Winch it in? Yeah, That's your name. name yeah. Cool, yeah. Nice one. Well, watch me get kicked out now. I think after the trouble I caused to get oh, this yeah, place on the map. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. God, yeah. I. So I'm, I've come like with my hat on. Yeah, so, see if no one so let's see if they don't recognise me. Yeah, I think exactly. come out my face. Yeah. Oh yeah, you, don't, you want me to blow you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll blow you out. Oh, that's it. Hi friends, can I just double check? I've not got a Mr. Williams or a Mr. Foreman here. Uh, yes, I'm here, Williams. Williams. Yes. Need to see this. Thank you, Mr. Williams. There's somewhere, I suppose. Cheers. So, huh, since since I came here, look, they've put a lock on that now. Here's a twig. Look, put the twig back in, so they can not say that I've been naughty. Oh, oh yeah, just going to the toilet. Is that okay? okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so straight down the end of the corridor. On the uh, left, is it? Yeah, through there, go to the left and straight down the end of the Yeah, morning. thank you. No worries, yeah, yeah. okay. <sighs> oh. Right, gents, Oy, that's what I need. Oh, Hope I'm not recording. <laughs> Be typical if I am, isn't it? No, oh, I was. I was totally bloody recording. How typical is that? How typical is that? Matt Williams recording in the toilet yet again. People, look, look, royal family going down the bunker. Look, royal family coming out the bloody bunker. No way. Just commenting, royal family coming out of the bunker. Yeah. On the thing, yes. Photos in that um, thing of the royal family coming out of the bunker entrance. Yeah. Yeah, like walking out. So, sort of like, I think it's the Queen Mother actually. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they all knew what was here. It's typical, isn't it? Yeah. See, I wonder who that woman is down there. That could be the, um, the, the headmistress who, I, who wrote, you know. She can't walk up down here when you was in the toilet. Yeah. Because she's probably like, you know, where's that f***ing Williams then? Well, she thinks she checks out and looking for everything you guys have. Probably. I put a video online earlier on. I, I said, um, I'm coming here today. Let's see whether they kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. My name's Mark Selwood. I shall be uh, guiding you around. But before that, a quick word for me and Harris, part of the uh, staff here of the office. Uh, so I'm Ian Harris, I'm the services and facilities manager for uh, Wicked Abbey School. Um, we are just about to be let down to the, uh, the bunker because we've done a little tour up the front here. Um, I'm going to be the last man on the tour, so I will be. You guys on. We have a limited amount of time down there. I know you've got cameras and bits and pieces, there might be stuff you want to photograph, but I will be moving you on. So please understand if I ask you to move on, we need to keep the tour together. It's a big bunker, I don't need any of you getting lost. Okay. I'm not OG Mark. Fantastic, thank you, Ian. Um, and Claire at the back will also be joining us, so uh, as they're both from the um, school staff, if they give you any instructions, please do follow them. Um, and of course, if there's any incident or anything like that, then uh, they will be able to coordinate any issues. So if there's any uh, medical incidents, we can uh, take care of that. Oh, I should also double check, has everyone got a torch?
at very least if you've got a light on a mobile phone. A lot of the bunker is lit, some spaces however are not at all and therefore I do need everyone to have uh, an individual torch rather than one between two. If you haven't got one, put your hand up and I think Ian has a few spares. Everyone happy? Splendid, let's carry on up the hill and we'll set the scene on, uh, for, the, uh, for the surface facility before we move underground. December 1941, which precipitated American entry into World War II. So we talk about 1939 to 1945, they talk about 1941 to 1945, when the real war began as far as uh, they are concerned. Um, a friendly invasion took place here in the UK, that's how it was often known. The Yanks were over here, about the old adage, overpaid, oversexed and over here. Um, two million United States service men and women transited via the UK either to serve the war effort here or indeed to transit onwards into France, Germany and elsewhere. <clears throat> of those two million, uh, half a million personnel at any one time were um, airmen or airwomen with the United States Army Air Force and that's why we have this American facility here in Wickham. Um, when the Americans came into the war, um, Winston Churchill rushed over to uh, Washington and within two weeks of Pearl Harbor, uh, the Washington Conference took place. High level strategic talks between the brand new allies of the UK and the USA on how they were going to conduct the war. And what Churchill wanted from that meeting more than anything else was a Europe first strategy. Ironically, the Americans agreed to that, even though they were just reeling from the sneak attack, as it was uh, coined, Japanese uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. American public opinion was baying the Japanese blood, but yet Roosevelt was persuaded that lock Germany out of the war first, then turn the full attention of the combined allies to Japan. So preparations had to begin immediately to receive this new friendly invasion. Um, and every service, army, navy and air force was looking for its own ways to liaise with their American counterparts. Royal Air Force and Bomber Command HQ was not far away at RAF Walters Ash, very close to High Wycombe, so they looked for a location close by so there was a physical um, uh, nearness between the two uh, Bomber Commands. And it, it was on the 28th of March 1942 that the Air Ministry turned up here and go, girls, you're doing great work, but I'm afraid it's time to go. The Americans are here and there's no room for a girls' school. Uh, we need your land, your buildings, and ultimately as it turns out, they landed beneath um, the site um, for the use of the United States um, Army Air Force. There was no US Air Force at that time, it was the Army Air Force. Actually, the US Air Force was created in 1947, but that's a lot of time. 
The girls had two weeks notice to move uh, because of requisition. There was a war on, a great imperative to get stuff done quickly. And the, um, the mighty 8th Air Force moved in here, or specifically 8th Bomber Command, because the mighty 8th Air Force was an integral air force. It had its own fighters, it had its own bombers, it had its own reconnaissance, its own supply and logistics, everything. It was uh, an entire organic air force. It wasn't the only one. The 8th gives it away. There were others as well. And it was Bomber Command, 8th Bomber Command of the 8th Air Force, that took up its headquarters uh, here um, at High Wycombe. It was immediately named uh, Station 101. That was the uh, bureaucratic code name for the place. Uh, but the Americans do like to personalise things a bit. And uh, within a few months, the camp was renamed Camp Lynn uh, in honour, if, if that's the right phrase, of uh, one of the early casualties of the 8th Air Force, uh, a second lieutenant, William G. Lynn Jr., uh, who was one of the first casualties of the 8th Air Force, um, who failed to return from a raid over Holland on the 4th of July, 1942. So the camp was named in honour of him. Pretty much a temporary camp up here on Dawes Hill. Quonset huts, Nissan huts, tentage, temporary wooden accommodation. They weren't building in bricks and mortar. It was very much a temporary location um, up here. But it had every facility that you'd expect uh, the Americans to have. So yes, it had accommodation, it had kitchens, it had a motor pool, uh, it even had entertainment facilities, the Red Cross Club, um, a cinema, things like that. Um, so lots of things took place here, um, including some, uh, some more famous visitors. So I'll give you an idea. Those of you who went to the Louvre may have seen the pictures already. Um, the girls' school's most famous celebrity visitor, arguably. Um, the famous musician Glenn Miller, who obviously was in uniform and um, hosting or well, entertaining American troops up and down Europe uh, with his orchestra band. And there is a picture of the Abbey itself. So next time you, after the tour, when you drive back down the hill, as you approach the Abbey, it's that flank, the green hillside sloping up behind him, that provides a splendid auditorium for Glenn Miller. Big army uh, articulated truck providing the temporary stage. A band sets up on the truck flatbed, and the service men and women enjoyed the music of the man and his orchestra and there's a close-up just to prove that uh, Glenn Mill was indeed here. Not quite his last concert before his untimely and mysterious uh, demise in an aircraft crash but uh, amongst the last of his performances. So I'll pass those around. Now what did the site look like? Well again I'll pass these pictures around so you can see them. This is a modern aerial photograph showing, let's have a look, uh, the roundabout down at the bottom of the hill, through which you came in through uh, security, the main abbey site itself, and behind it, this big green wooded uh, area, this is Dawes Hill itself. Dawes Hill House up at the top, and what was the site of um, RAF High Wycombe, and is now uh, a substantial and indeed growing and, um, housing estate, I believe. If you're, if you're local, you will know better than I. What did it look like in the 40s? Well. This photograph shows the hill that you either drove, or in most cases walked up, um, and as you, as you can see when you walked up, there were school playing fields on the left hand side, housing and green grass on the, um, sorry, school playing fields on the left, green grass and housing on the uh, right. Back in those days, that housing was, as I said, very temporary in nature, wooden huts, things like that, this huge sprawling camp up here, down there, all over the place. Uh, again, you will have seen the photographs of the uh, classic American baseball diamonds, lots of those out on covering what were girls' hockey pictures and things like that for uh, the entertainment of the American troops. We're up here where the road has a, a switchback, as the Americans would call it, and the bunker is hidden amongst the trees, almost at the top of the hill. So, pass those around as well. I'll give you the quick potted history now, uh, just for the full history of the bunker, because Whilst it's a World War II bunker, its, its heyday arguably came after the Second World War. So by 1946 the bunker is out of use. It was a command and control bunker for 8th Bomber Command, as we have said. And with 1945 and victory in Europe, most American personnel are repatriated, or in many cases actually moved on to the Far East and continuing conflict up until VJ Day. Um, Camp Lynn had an ongoing use, it was also used to house homeless people, particularly from London, whose homes had been destroyed in the Blitz, until such time as uh, housing stock could be replenished and rebuilt. Um, but that was only for a few years. So once again, there's another close-up photograph of what Camp Lynn looked like. That's the lake at the bottom of the hill, and again the road going up. And a similar-ish photograph, albeit taken from the opposite compass point showing the top of Dawes Hill, the school down here, and you can see, I'm going to take my 
itself. There we go. This is the road up from the lake. The fields either side are empty. So what had had all of these temporary buildings by 1949, they are gone. And the site is largely above ground, been returned to the way it was before the American friendly invasion. But by 1950, the, the Cold War uh, between the former Allied wartime powers, particularly uh, Britain and uh, the United States in the West and the Soviet Union in the East, had turned a bit frostier. Um, whilst it never became a, cold, uh, a hot war as such, um, not directly between the Russians and the West, there were flashpoints, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Korean War. We'll mention a few of those uh, as we go around the tour. So by 1950, certainly when the Korean War uh, was, uh, was begun, there was a revival of interest and a resurgence in an American military presence in Britain. In 1952, Strategic Air Command of the newly formed United States Air Force decides to reoccupy the bunker. Um, and the 3929th Air Base Squadron is installed to run it as a camp and a bunker facility. And that's when the site gets renamed United States Air Force Site High Wickham. <laughs> to regularise the arrangements, in 1954, the um, Air Ministry purchased all of the land up here, a compulsory purchase from the school. So what was all school property up here is now housing. Uh, sadly, is, uh, is no longer the school's courtesy of the Air Ministry in 1954. But for some reason, and this is still not entirely clear, the compulsory purchase did not include this little patch of real estate here where the bunker was. And you'd have thought that was the most important thing that should have been compulsory purchased. It wasn't. It was merely leased, which is a good thing. Otherwise, these talks would not have taken place and the bunker could even have been destroyed and filled in. More of that later on. Um, the lease was for 56 years. Um, and the bunker was then in use for the early part of the Cold War. But by the mid-60s, with the advent of mid-air refuelling, there was less requirement, thank you, less requirement for um, <coughs> bomber stations in East Anglia or elsewhere in Britain. Up until that point, we needed to have the Americans in forward bases close to Europe. We were um, America's uh, biggest aircraft carrier, as the, uh, as the joke goes. Um, but with mid-air refuelling, you could then maintain those flights above the North Pole and have the uh, B-52 bombers of uh, American Strategic Air Command on constant watch so that they were mere minutes from the Soviet Union, not hours from the Soviet Union. So with that, less requirement to have all these facilities here in the UK. And by 1976, the mid-70s, the bunker was stripped out and virtually empty. And a second phase of the bunker's use had ended. A third phase takes place in the 1980s. Again, we get a bit of a resurgence in the Cold War. The advent of uh, the Thatcher government here in this country, and the Reagan government in the US, means that suddenly we've got a new arms race. And, and the, uh, the tactic that wins the Cold War, if that's the right phrase, is ultimately uh, breaking the uh, Soviet Union economically, outspending them, more missiles, more bunkers, preparing for a nuclear war and, and surviving a nuclear war, if that's indeed ever possible, that was, the, that was the tactic. So bunkers get refurbished, British ones, American ones, or in this case, American ones in Britain. Um, so effectively what we're about to visit is a 1980s bunker, uh, re uh, refurbished from its wartime uh, original uh, war wartime origins. So we're, we're entering a bunker that was built in the Second World War in 1942 uh, at a cost of £250,000, no less, um, built in just 11 months. Again, get Rossland and all these other big civil engineering projects that take years. In, in wartime, things get done quickly. 11 months to build this massive bunker at a cost of a quarter of a million pounds worth of 1940s money. It. So it's, as I say, a World War II bunker, but it will look very 1980s when we get down there, um, for obvious reasons. So, that is that. What do we have here? Has anyone been to the bunker before? I think one gentleman said you were here about 50 <laughs> years ago. Blank your way in, you knew somebody, you knew somebody. Uh, Lieutenant. Yep. Excellent. Absolutely, and that was the case. I mean, a lot of the times you see dual um, signs. So if you go up to RAF Milden Hall, it will say RAF Milden Hall, home to whatever squadron, wing, etc. So the niceties had to be observed. We couldn't just sell the Americans. This didn't then become American property. It was always British property, Air Ministry property, given over, leased temporarily to the friendly invasion that was the, uh, the Americans. So British property, but absolutely branded from good old Uncle Sam. Yeah, 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 yeah. So again? We'll cover that right at the end. We'll cover that at the end. So, uh, my, my end to the story. So, if you were driving through um, 
the base. I've got a few more pictures here. So for locals you may recall this picture here. The armed Air Force, US Air Force Guard at the front. And yes, it, it does say High Wickham Air Station, United States Air Force. Um, all the red, white and blue there as well. To access the bunker, you'd have had to have driven through the whole of um, the base. So again, there's rings of security. You've got to get through the front gate. You've got to go through the tightly controlled, guarded compound. Oh, got a compound. It's a huge area up there. And then you come down to this even more secure and secret Holy of Holies. Everything about it is secret, even the names. There's bureaucratic camouflage here. It doesn't say secret nuclear bunker. It merely has a bureaucratic HQSTC contract branch west. So somebody seeing that is not going to know what is hidden at the back here. It implies it's some kind of logistic compound, but um, it is far more than that. So any vehicles coming here, as I say, you've already been checked, double checked, triple checked. You're then placed with a VCT, a vehicle checkpoint here. This uh, yellow metal would be a ramp, hydraulic ramp, that would lift up, giving you a sheer ramp and a slope behind. So again, vehicles can't just bash through the barrier. You've got a physical elevated metal uh, ramp, a sharp cliff edge facing you. If the guard is happy, we'll let you drive across. Another barrier, a massive concrete plinths either side. Again, even in a big seven-ton truck packed with explosives, I'm not sure you'd be able to break through barrier like this. It's substantial and that speaks volumes about the security and the secret nature of the site. So come on down and let's walk in. And yet more security as well. You notice you're actually entering a vehicle airlock, if you want to call it that. Gates yeah. either side. One stays shut, one gets open. In comes the vehicle. That one closes behind you. So if anything untoward is discovered, you can't just put it in reverse and try and hightail it. You are held by the military security of the site. A guardhouse there, bulletproof glass. Again, that kind of uh, milky green effect indicates how thick the glass is there. And again, a fence between us and the guard with all the red buttons to push if uh, a Soviet agent has been discovered trying to get into the base. Card readers, again, so ID cards can be read in here and only when the guard is happy, the consignment yeah. kit or whatever has been checked, manifest, docket, paperwork have all been uh, cleared, well they then open the gates and once more you are into the bunker compound proper. So, thanks to the wonders of the internet and kind of friends reunited style veterans um, sites, we've got some of the memories of the uh, service men and women from the United States Air Force that did stay up here at US Air Force site High Wycombe, as well as the entrance from the kind of early 80s, that one is. You've got some um, 1960s pictures of the married quarters, all of the, the Morris vehicles that would have been purchased by the servicemen here, living as they were, as you see down there, in fairly Spartan uh, quarters. These, this is still the military, even if it is the Americans. And for a later age, again, people may have seen photographs of the more modern base in the 1980s and 1990s. I'll pass these around. The red, white and blue is everywhere. All of the normal amenities, the racquetball courts, the basketball courts. An American school as well. We'll, we'll talk about the uh, school kids that were here as well a little bit later on in the tour. So I'll pass those around. But once you pass through that camp, you're now into the inner compound here. And again, its own fence around this, separating this from the ordinary service personnel of the base. Um, a number of surface buildings which date from the Second World War. 
Um, the security all facing outwards, again, stopping people getting in. All the lights are facing outwards across the fence. The fence itself, topped with barbed wire. A second fence, so you've got a dead zone in between. Potentially you could have run dogs in there. Certainly um, <laughs> somebody in that dead zone, if they're trying to escape, will have, uh, is going to be slowed down by the fact that there are two fences. The inner fence here, punctuated every now and again with these boxes. Any idea what those do? Alarms. Form of alarm, a trembler alarm. So if someone's trying to clamber onto this, the motion sensor is going to ring in the, uh, in the guard hut and somebody will go, right, sensor number 23, get out there to the uh, northwest east flank and find out what's going on. Armed guards would and indeed did patrol here. Uh, I'm told by a previous um, head of grounds maintenance here uh, from staff that, that, that used to work here in the heyday that uh, whenever the school gardeners would get too close to the fence down there from the school up here, uh, an armed Marine Corps guard, by then the site was in Navy hands, again, more of that later, um, would give, tell him in a Texas drawl in no uncertain terms, to get the hell out of here, because he was too close to the, uh, to the secure fence. What else do we have? Uh, as well as the guard hut you've seen there, you've got a number of um, service buildings, if you like. So, over there, the corrugated iron uh, building, building um, 1709. That houses huge uh, water tanks, again, for servicing the bunker down underground. And again, when the school finally got this compound back, the gardens got quite excited, thinking, perfect, gravity-fed water tanks, we can let water flow down the hill, sprinklers, it'll be perfect. Unfortunately, uh, in the um, decommissioning of the bunker, they all got filled with um, vacuum foam. So you've now got two enormous weight cubes of vacuum foam, uh, which are no good to, uh, to anyone. You've got the generator building here, building 1707. Um, not just this building, but down below, to where you can see that metal railing there. In a minute, we'll walk around the front of it, and huge metal armoured doors uh, protecting the generator and the backup generator. Every bunker has not just generators in case the power supply is cut off, but a backup generator in case the first one fails. Quite why they're above ground, all right, better for venting, but it would seem a little bit of a a weakness to have such a key facility above ground. I'm sure there was a plan for it at the time, I just don't know what that was. So the bunker, uh, power supply, water supply, and of course venting as well. So in a sealed gas type bunker, you need to have the facility to draw in air, scrub it with filters to make it breathable, and then of course exhaust any uh, spent air. So the great big concrete cubes you see, one down by the white vans, one nestled amongst the trees there, and up the hill, just behind these green trees where the white van is on this level, three big vent shafts that come up from the bunker. Um, they look a bit different to the way they did in the Second World War, so those big concrete cubes are 1980s refurbishments to armour the tops of the vent shafts to give them greater protection in the event of a, a nuclear exchange and, and World War III. And of course, closest to us here, the emergency exit to the bunker, out of which we'll be coming at the end of the tour. Right, that is what we have. So we're going downstairs, we'll go past the big um, generator uh, doors. Notice the, uh, the school beehives on top of the, uh, the generator building there as well. Probably quite quiet at the moment. But let's go and have a look at the main entrance. See the big armoured metal doors of the generator building?
Okay, so again, here are the main entrances, and, and these look substantially different for, to the way they would have done in the Second World War. So again, everything we see here, the, another guard hut here in Cinderblock, um, the cages protecting either entrance, those are part of the 1980s Reagan era refurbishments to make the site uh, even more secure. Uh, in the Second World War, those simple concrete ramps, retaining walls either side, that is what uh, uh, eight Bomber Command personnel would have seen. Um, at this point, you can also get an idea of the topography. You can see the slope of Dawes Hill, and each one of these vent shafts, these great big concrete blocks, is for one level of the three-level bunker that we're about to visit. So the bottom floor vented through that shaft, the middle floor vented through that shaft up there, and the top floor through the one right at the uh, top of the site. And you get an idea for the topography of the site and the layout of the bunker. It is three floors. The bottom floor is the biggest, because it's further underground. The slope of the hill comes up, which means that the middle floor is slightly uh, narrower, and the top floor is narrowest of all, because it all conforms to the slope of the bunker. We're going to enter here, which is actually roughly about the middle level of the bunker, and we're going to go down steps to the bottom floor until at the end we will come out up a flight of steps. So in terms of what these uh, entrances look like, we have some more pictures. Most of the pictures I've got are of um, the surface site, either the aerial photographs you've already seen, or Glenn Miller, things like that. Very few photographs of the, the top secret bunker itself, as you might expect. I've got just two, uh, and I'll show you those a bit later on. Sometimes photography is encouraged, particularly when the, uh, the information ministry come into town and there is a bit of propaganda here. So this picture shows the arrival of the first WAX, the Women's Army Corps um, service, uh, and this is da, 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 the, it's gone, never mind, it's in July of 1943, the, the specific date itself doesn't matter, but the main abbey building down at the bottom, and here is the propaganda photograph of the uh, ladies in the lovely A-line skirts and tight khaki, slightly wrinkled um, stockings there, all glamorous stuff, but again, it's all great to show that the, uh, the American uh, presence over here is helping to win the war. On the other side, even more important VIPs in the form of royalty. Um, this is taken just after VE Day 1945, showing the King and the Queen, no less. King George and Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, who obviously most of us remember as the Queen Mother, uh, rather than the current Queen Elizabeth, uh, accompanied there by General Doolittle and uh, various senior officers of the mighty 8th Air Force, coming out of one or other of these entrances. And you can see them gleaming white, the concrete brand new, um, no doubt there would have been camouflage nets over the top of that to stop the German photo recce specialists from seeing stuff like that. But again, that was always a challenge. Bright white concrete. It looks grey and dull and covered in moss now, but would have seen very different when it was brand new. You can decide for yourself which entrance that was they were coming out of, but the photographer would have been stood somewhere out where we are, taking a picture that way, and here were the king and queen at no less. The king, notice, in his RAF uniform. He had uniforms for all three services and uh, wore them at the appropriate time. So, what do we have here in terms of the entrances? As I say, an, another guard hut here, building 1700. More bulletproof glass, which someone has seen fit to test by the look of it. Uh, and again, that's thanks, I think, to the United States Marine Corps, who were the very last users of the bunker. We could even call that a fourth phase of use. Uh, when it was really used, unfortunately, not for the purpose it was attended, they merely used it as a CQB location, a close quarter battle location, where... Uh, they practice hostage rescue and room clearances and breaching of walls and things like that. So by that point, the bunker was deemed not fit for the, the uh, purpose it was built and therefore could be turned over to the sledgehammers, battering rams and uh, small arms of the US Marine Corps, of which, as I say, they appear to have tested against the glass there. The cage is there for additional security, but the fact you've got two entrances brings the bunker up to sort of our modern nuclear standard. Um, you have a dirty entrance and a clean entrance. So in peacetime, the routine entrance is the clean one. You simply go straight through into the bunker itself. In wartime, you lock that entrance off. And if there is a radiologically contaminated environment here, I don't know, personnel for whatever reason have to come outside, if they re-enter the bunker, clearly they've got to go through decontamination. So that's the dirty entrance, the dirty personnel. Strip off your outer garment, put them in the incinerator, which we'll see inside. Go through a, a shower facility, put on clean clothes or paper coveralls or whatever, and only then, once you are deemed to be contaminated and once again clean, can you enter the pressurised bunker um, and make your way inside. So, we can either go through the dirty entrance or the clean entrance. Any, any preference? 
dirty. Yes, everyone always says that, so uh, <laughs> we will do so. There is a bit of a puddle of water out there, so uh, it's only about an inch or so deep, so you should be okay, but if anyone has footwear that they'd rather not get wet, you can come in through the clean entrance. Um, we'll go through decontamination. You can see, again, you're going to go through an airlock. Two massive doors, each about a foot thick, with great big um, circular handles like you get in submarines and things like that, again, because it is a pressurised airtight door. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, big old uh, racks as well. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. That's right. Ooh. Well, that's the other way in, is it? That would be the other way in. Sorry, thanks. Closing up, we'll try and get everyone down here onto this level. Hopefully, Ian will be on the back because it's always good to do. How are we doing? A few more, yeah. A few more to come? <laughs> That's it. Is that everyone? Yeah. Ian? Is that yeah. you there? Great stuff. So, we're now into the bottom level of the bunker itself. Um, 23,000 square feet of space within the bunker, uh, roughly three football pitches, just not spread equally over the levels. This is the biggest level and they get progressively smaller. Um, <coughs> It was built uh, in the Second World War in 1942, as I said, uh, and proofed against any munition that the Germans could drop at that time, including V-2 rockets and things like that. Clearly, if someone dropped an atomic bomb, even one just the size of uh, the ones that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, if it was a direct hit, the bunker would not um, survive. Uh, atomic weapons are simply too powerful. Security, I suppose, lies in the fact that the targeting... Um, uh, information and the targeting um, techniques of the time, certainly in the 50s, 60s and 70s, would not really have been able to pinpoint this exact bunker. It would probably survive a near miss. Mm -hmm. So yes, something um, the other side of Wickham would uh, incinerate the town, contaminate the atmosphere utterly and make it uh, unsafe and deadly to emerge, but hopefully the bunker would protect you. Now, 
What we're going to do in a moment is make our way through the plant areas first. And they're, they're quite unique and it's one of the reasons why the uh, bunker has the current level of listing that it does. Because it's actually a double skinned bunker. One could say it's a bunker within a bunker. So around the perimeter of the bottom floor, in fact the, the whole of the bunker, uh, you've got a void. So you've actually got um, a 10 foot thick outer wall. Um, you've then got a further, I don't know, 8 or 9 feet of void and then another um, uh, wall as well. <coughs> Correction, they're five foot thick walls. Five foot thick wall, ten foot void, and then another five foot wall. Uh, and again, different um, bunker busting munitions particularly are designed to penetrate one wall and then explode in the void inside because that's where the people are probably going to be. So you put a void inside and you can um, hopefully get the uh, energy of that bunker busting munition dissipated in the harmless void rather than penetrating the second wall as well. You've then also got a concrete bed that it sits on, you've got a further 10 foot concrete slab uh, as a roof um, to it as well. So uh, that void is what makes this bunker construction so unique and it is unique in the United Kingdom. Yep, there are other double skin bunkers elsewhere but this is it for the UK. And in the 1980s, when the Reagan era planners decided to refurb the bunker, they needed a lot more kit, equipment and plant than they did in the Second World War. For a start, the Second World War bunker um, wouldn't have been proofed against quite the same level of radiological contaminants that we needed in the, in the uh, Cold War. Better filters, better air scrubbers, more powerful exhaust and extraction. Much more in the way of computer equipment, obviously, so far more in the way of power plant also required to service all of that. Now, if you chucked all that extra plant inside the bunker, you'd reduce the amount of space for people to work in massively. So the planners came up with a unique solution, and they used the, um, the bomb void um, between the two five foot thick walls and filled it with plant. P people didn't go down there, it was wasted space as far as they were concerned. A direct hit from a bunker busting munition would destroy the bunker in any case, um, so it was really only proved, as I say, against near misses of atomic weapons. So that is what we're about to see. So we've got two doors here, it gives us a full walk around four sides of the bunker so you can properly understand the size of this, the biggest floor, but it is unlit. So this is where I will need everyone to put their torches on or get them uh, at the ready. There are a couple of obstacles in the sense of occasionally there's a low handle from a, um, something or other just above you so you can play a giant game of uh, Chinese whispers and when we get to it and I say yeah head obstruction or, or mind your head pass it back to the person behind you all the way down the chain hopefully <coughs> no one bumps their bumps. On the whole it's fairly flat there's a couple of steps down a couple of doorways to step through so again make sure you keep your torches uh, where your feet are and uh, no one will go astray. We'll come back to this location here. Again, there is gas proof ceiling to, uh, to this void as well. We're going to go through a Belling Lee Intech Limited knife edge door. Um, English construction in Enfield there. What does it say about the knife edge door? Regularly clean each side of the knife edge with solvent or a fine cloth. Stubborn stains, if, if they bother by those, uh, may be carefully removed with a fine abrasive. Lightly smear petroleum jelly on the cleaned areas. Lightly oil the thrust races in the hinges. Uh, and there's two of them. So again, you've got uh, an airlock effectively um, in here as well. The knife edge door, you can see its construction as you come past. It's almost like two letter C's locking into each other. So there's effectively a knife edge that pushes between metal and rubber seals to give uh, a tight, gas tight seal. Right, so all of the plant is laid out here. We're going to go past the sewage areas first, then past the non-drinking water areas, then through air filters, until eventually we come past... Matt? Watch your head. Yeah. Sewage tanks.
channel last night by somebody who said like you're always, pull, you're always pushing and pulling things like yeah I don't think that <laughs> yeah yeah watch your head on this apparently and another one if you're tall Yeah, cheers. Yep. Can you turn him on? Uh, turn it on. No. <laughs> That's a nice bit of rubber there. Eh? And they got a nice uh, hoist, hoist in the roof up there. A little window or something, yeah. Looks like the uh, take the whole lot um, with a crane, crane off the roof. You don't often see this much equipment in a bunker for the water and filtering. This is like a level I've never seen before. It's absolutely huge. And all the walls here are all metal and welded, welded seams throughout the whole of the outside. Probably checked for air tightness as well. Yeah, watch as a trip hazard here. Okay, cheers. Bit moist down here. It's a 400 amp switch box, that. Yeah. Yep, cheers. This is this knife edge, knife edge um, thing. Oh, air filters. Air filter bags up there. So we're in the void at the moment. So these are ladders to the void. Right, I pause here. We're basically halfway around the perimeter walk. Um, again, giving you an idea of the scale of the bunker. You may have noticed coming along this corridor that we've just walked down that the ceiling has got progressively higher and higher and higher as we move deeper into the hill. And we're now, where I'm stood, you can see the underside of the third floor uh, of the bunker. Whereas beforehand we only had the ceiling on the, on the ground floor above us. Um, we've also got more blast doors, slightly more modest than the, uh, the, the exterior ones. And again, gas type doors behind those as well. Because here there is a ladder which does go all the way to the surface, well, just short of the emergency exit. So again, if someone is trapped down here in this plant space, you could get out this way um, as well. That also presents a weakness. What if there is a near-miss blast? and suddenly kinetic energy is trying to rush down this emergency shaft into the heart of the bunker, hence having its own separate blast doors to try and keep the plant areas completely contained and separated 
from this uh, emergency um, exit here. Um, what else do we have? Um, Someone's already spotted a piece of an unusual American arcana. Uh, Americana here. Left over behind a can of mellow yellow. The like of which had never graced the shelves of Sainsbury's or Tesco's, I suspect. No doubt it is an uber sugar rich and caffeine rich drink. Yeah, it is caffeinated. Um, so left behind by uh, the, the last American engineer that came down here to, uh, to service the kit and equipment. Um, so we've gone through most of the, the plant areas in terms of sewage, in terms of non-potable water, in terms of um, uh, gas filtration and the uh, air extraction and air um, exhaust. Um, as this is the halfway point, we're now furthest from um, that entrance. We've actually got one side of the bunker down here, this corridor, which is completely empty. So obviously there was only so much plant equipment they needed. When you go around the corner there, that's where we enter uh, an electrical engineer's paradise with the, the vast great substations, transformers, breakers, and everything else required for electrical power. Once you go step through this, uh, this blast door here, go forward a few feet past the ladder and turn around and look behind you, and you'll actually see one of the big filter units, air filter units, open with all of its filter units on display. It looks like the world's biggest collection of the doormats, all presented sideways, but they're the fibrous filters through which radiological, chemical, and biological contaminants will be filtered to provide uh, clean air to breathe in case of nuclear attack. Right, step up. And we will pass through this door. Should have had me in here before, see? Yeah. One, one torch sees all. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it all on. Pretty big, isn't it? I get told off if I play with that yeah, one, yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty Yeah. Step. It's another step. Substation standby, interconnecting bus bar link. So this is from the outside to the inside. Transformers. Transformer number two. 
and more, more massive gallery space above us. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, mate. <laughs> Oops, I did it again. <laughs> Watch your step. It's a uh, sort of transformer. Just put a seat in there. High voltage stuff. There's a drain cover on the floor. Got a bit of a step up here. Oh God! Oh, I've tripped now. Oh, you never told me about it. Thanks. Basically, ready to get out then. And this is an airlock door. Dual airlock, by looks. So you've got rubber, rubber stuff there, and uh, some sort of seal mechanism. That's an alarm. It's an alarm sensor there <coughs> to see whether the doors have been opened in an unauthorised way and similar there. So that would have been that would have been the alarm piece there then. Onto that switch. Knife edge doors. Yeah. So the way we came in, this was we're all we're going all the way around, is it? It's the same same space, right? We are stood in an airlock here in the control. So actually, in this case, you can operate both doors inside and out. No doubt, under a. Um, World War Three war fighting conditions, they would have uh, uh, cut that off, and actually only people inside could have controlled the uh, entrance and exit. So you can come in from the outside, having passed through decontamination, and then come in here, open the outer, this airlock door, and this is merely the inner airlock, we've already got the airlocks up top as well, um, and again, you have to the intercom, say, hello, this is me, can I come in? And only if they're happy, we can buzz you through this airlock into the actual command and control bunker itself. Right, we'll make our way to the first yeah. of the big rooms. Don't worry, we will go off left and right on the doors and we'll see all the side Spring loaded these doors. Are they spring loaded? Because it looks like it wants to sort of close, is it? Uh, no, I think they'll close. Yeah. A step. Uh, a step? No. Can't do these. A bit scary. You are not locked in. Hmm. Doors are naturally wanting to close by themselves. Okay, thanks. Clearance required. There we go, if you want to make your way into the... Okay. Just toilets, isn't it? Cafe. Yeah, cafe, if only. If only. <clears throat> right. Okay, so, as we mentioned outside, this is largely a 1980s era bunker, <clears throat> albeit refurbished from the old World War II physical wall. So all those walls that we passed through in the past void, those were World War II 1942 construction. You now in what looks clearly a little bit more modern, albeit a bit knocked around. And again, that's courtesy of our chums from the United States Marine Corps, no doubt practicing um, room clearance and breaching techniques. So sometimes if you're, uh, if you're in an office building like this, which is essentially what we're in, temporary walls, you can't get through a door, sometimes the quickest way is to take a sledgehammer to uh, uh, stop all partitions and you can then get access that way. And certainly, it's not bulletproof as the Marines have demonstrated. 
what usage mm. each room was. Are we coming down in here? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Okay. okay. And in any case, in any historic building, be it a castle, a stately home, or in this case a bunker, it would have gone through phases of use, just as this one did from the early Cold War to the late Cold War. And every time room uses might have changed, partition walls put in where they weren't there in the 1940s, and accurate records of secret locations not always maintained. All we know of this room is it's rooms 111 and 112. Nothing on the door to indicate what it was used for. Some of the other doors do have clues and indicators. What it does, however, have is a warning. Uh, danger of asphyxiation. Hang on, 1301, fire protected area. Uh, clearly, the kitchen equipment is important. Some of you might say more important than human beings in it. So if you did have a fire in here, the halon system could come on, the doors would lock, all of the oxygen would be extracted from the room, and hey presto, the fire would be put out. Full um, Again, any human beings in here would also be extinguished because uh, the oxygen would be removed from the room. So uh, it is uh, not necessarily assisted use these days, but um, you'll be glad to know it's not operational now. Uh, what else do we have in here? Black boxes on the walls with pipes in between, um, looking fairly routine and pedestrian. Um, this is part of the Tempest system. Uh, Tempest, I have to read my notes because it's, it's a long old acronym. Telecommunications, electronics, materials protected from emanating spurious transmissions. That's what Tempest stands for. Um, it's part of MSEC, or M, um, Emissions Security. And these days we're well aware of hacking and all the dangers posed by um, email and electronic communications. But one would hope that encryption means we can defeat that kind of level of hacking at a governmental level. However, there are other uh, emission security issues. So all the cables that come out the back of your PCs give off a certain or leak a certain amount of uh, electric energy. And with complex monitoring kit, if you get close enough to those cables, you can read, if not in, in, the, in their entirety, partially the information that is being um, passed down those electronic cables, even if it's encrypted. You can also get close enough to a computer to monitor the keystrokes that are being made. So you can get, yeah, K, T, E, and you can record all that kind of stuff. And the Tempest system, uh, Tempest is actually part of a, an operation that's still ongoing today. Operation Tempest is still ongoing. And it covers all manner of eavesdropping, counter eavesdropping measure, things like that. But specifically for co computers and PCs, this is the, uh, the, uh, the security kit. So if the cleaner in the corridor outside is actually a KGB agent and sitting, sitting there with monitoring kit hidden in their mop and bucket, hopefully this will defeat the efforts of the KGB to eavesdrop on the uh, uh, communications kit in this room. So there we go. Now, what are we heading into now? We're going to go through a uh, conference room. J2, J3, J1, C, and see your watch. Where's Henry Clark? We'll find out more about that. Watch your steps. So yeah, a couple more steps down into this room. Which is a conference room. So the sign here, do not enter, briefing in progress. I think we'll leave that there, that's useful for me. Um, Clearly some kind of conference room in here, uh, where decision makers would make higher level decisions. Um, some signs left on the wall up there, what might those signs be for? Clocks, absolutely, I would suggest for clocks. Washington DC, stateside, back home where the president is, you need to know what time it is there because if you've got important information for the president, do you want to wake him up or not? Um, local time, absolutely, that's, uh, that's key for where we are. FRG, what might that be? Federal Republic of Germany. Federal Republic of Germany, absolutely. West Germany. We're talking 1980s when East Germany was Soviet, West Germany or the Federal Republic uh, was part of, uh, part of NATO. That would be the front line in World War III, uh, East versus West. So it's important to know what your air base is and your forward units in the Federal Republic, what time zone they are on. Three signs, like one, two, three, four hooks in the wall. There's one sign missing. What time zone might that be? 
Moscow. Moscow, absolutely, the main enemy. Um, you need to know what, uh, what time the, the enemy are working to as well. Uh, I don't know for sure, but when the bunker was decommissioned at the last Department of Defence or a US Air Force uh, airman left. What better souvenir for a Cold War warrior than the sign saying Moscow to, uh, to take home as a souvenir? So possibly sat on someone's desk somewhere or in a box in a dusty attic. But yeah, four time zones so the conferences can make the right call and make the right decisions. Well, let's push on. Telephone sockets. Thanks. I mentioned that um, they, they tried to tuck away almost all of the plant equipment in that big void, so as not to take up spaces uh, or space within the. Um, within the bunker, there's one exception to that, there is a, there is a plant going up on the middle floor that we'll have a look at. But you also have controls in some cases of plant equipment, so you don't have to go into that void in order, in this case, to access all of the um, uh, pumping equipment, either for pumping air or for pumping liquid. So the sewage effluent tanks, right. their controls Thanks. are here. So again, you don't have to go down into the, uh, into the void to do that. So quite nice and old school with all these these great big red warning lights and volume flow meters and things like that. But we'll see a little bit more plant, as I say, on the second floor. Right, let's go back into the corridor. I'll just do a quick run down there, very quick. Let's just have a quick... So I don't think we're going to be coming back in here, are we? I guess we won't be coming back in some of these places. <laughs> okay, a little bit more cosy in uh, rooms 106 and 107. So a little either supervisor's area or possibly uh, an even more secure facility in, uh, in that room there. A clue as to what the room was used for, we've got uh, a name tag ECJ5 staff. Uh, EC standing for European Command because this was the um, Strategic Air Force's European Theatre of Operations War Command Centre. So if World War III had taken place, all European Air Force operations for the US Air Force would have been commanded and controlled from this bunker here, so European Command. J5, um, J for Joint, 
So in the Army, um, <coughs> Navy and Air Force, if they're operating together, as they frequently do, we talk about that as a joint environment rather than just naval or just Army or something like that. Whilst this is an Air Force bunker, um, nevertheless, they will have liaison with the other forces. So all departments are begun with the prefix J. That's exactly the same in um, the British Army or the British Armed Forces. So it's a NATO-wide thing. And departments are split up into numbered ones. So J1 would be personnel. Uh, J2 would be intelligence. Uh, J3 would be operations. Uh, J4, supply and logistics. And in this case, J5 is operational planning. <coughs> So this is where a lot of plans would be located. So the staff from the planning department will be using this. This is where all of their, their stuff would be. Even more secure, you've got the remains of a Manifoil combination lock on there. So civil servants will remember that. Bankers, people like that. The old combination lock. Turn this way to the right, and to the left, and to the right, etc. Ah, I've gone too far. Start all over again. Um, in addition, there's an intercom. So once you're inside here and you've got planning documents out, you don't want someone bursting in and going, oh, goodness, uh, planning for World War III. Right, what's going on? So you lock it and there's an intercom and someone tips it. Hello, Bob, it's me. Can I come in, please? No, you can't. Um, and it would require the person in the room to unlock the door to allow somebody uh, inside. As the sign says, this is a restricted area, even within this absolutely top secret bunker, and a six-level security badge is required. Now, I try as I might, I have not found out what the different levels of the security badge are. Is that really high? Is that really low? Is that in the middle of the road? Is it 1 to 10? Is it 10 to 1? Um, so anyone with any experience in the Department of Defence in, in America, let me know and I can uh, pass that on. Um, and clearly, that's evidence of the, the US Marine Corps, again, practising breaching techniques on pretty sturdy metal doors. So there's sledgehammer marks around the lock, the lock has been smashed off. And somebody has had a proper go at that door with a sledgehammer and whacked it a good few dozen times. So there we go. Well, let's push on. Now in another room, what do we have here? Director, ECJ2, plans. Um, EC, still European Command, J2, that's intelligence. Uh, so if we have operational planning in the previous room, this is intelligence uh, plans. Uh, so again, another secret um, uh, location in here. Quite why it's got the gas analyzer in the corner there. Um, is it an infrared gas analyzer from memory? Yep. Seems a bit weird. I'm not sure why that's in here. Uh, there must have been a reason. It hasn't been moved from somewhere else. It does seem a fairly rudimentary knock a hole through the ceiling to get the wiring. Um, I'm afraid I don't know what that <coughs> Otherwise, an intelligence uh, planning area. One thing you might have noticed, uh, the eagle eye amongst you, uh, if you look at the wall sockets, we've got a mixture of British 3 pin 240 volt sockets and American 2 pin. Um, 110 volt sockets, all side by side. So, if your civil servant or an airman in here buys a desk fan at uh, Walmart in Tennessee, you can plug it in. And if you buy it in Woolworths in High Wycombe, you can also plug it in there. So, again, everything side by side with the dual power systems. Right, now we're about to make our way up to the, uh, the middle floor. We're going to use one of the staircases to do that. Just to the right of the staircase, at the foot of the staircase, you can, uh, you can look up and the ceiling is not a, a, a full ceiling, it's actually a, a hydraulically operated metal trap door. Um, and um, 
that was basically access for stores and equipment. As we go up the bunker, you'll see more of those hydraulic operated trap doors. So you can drop pallets of computer equipment, furniture, water, rations to keep the place supplied. Um, so uh, notice that as we go up. When we get to the top of the stairs, we're going to go straight ahead into another plant room. Um, Again, lots of air filtration and then they've massively upgraded that. Uh, and on your right as you go into that room there's a splendid bank that's worthy of Thunderbirds in terms of the amount of lights and bells and gadgets and whistles on it. Uh, I've merrily flicked all the switches and nothing has been humming into life so you're probably safe to do that if you wish as well. And then we'll, uh, as you go along that plant room um, there is a head height obstruction at the end so just go duck underneath that. Hydraulic, um, hydraulic lifters. Yeah, yeah. that plate that's on upstairs. Oh right. Yeah, hydraulic lifters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's two sides. There's a tube above it. Yeah, I'm looking at that. There's nothing in here, is it? It's a little. The storage cupboard. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
How are we doing? Yeah. 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 All good. So, do we have anyone that can translate the uh, enigmatic graffiti? <coughs> There's Arabic, very good. There's Greek, very good. Don't know if there's Cyrillic. Some of some Greek looks very akin to Cyrillic, but you could be right. Anything else? There's obviously a very erudite audience. I'm pleased with that. You've got some classical scholars here, and they're Arabic and they're Greek. Um, yes, absolutely. I don't think a US Marine did it. No, I think you're probably right. Not that I want to do disservice to the, uh, the good old core. Um, the, you're right, it's absolutely a mixture of uh, Arabic and um, Greek letters with a couple of random, there's hearts and other devices uh, that are chucked in as well. Uh, translating would be difficult. I'm told actually that it, there is no message here whatsoever. They are just cool, random letters that have been chucked on the wall by someone that doesn't actually speak the language, but is just looking at a book and is copying cool stuff. Uh, it dates from a Halloween party held here uh, in the mid-1990s. Again, roughly the same kind of era that the US Marines were using it as a CQB facility, not um, as a command and control bunker. Uh, and that's because it was done by uh, students from the London Central High School, which, in spite of its name, was not in London at all, it was here uh, on base, and it was for children of uh, the Air Force service personnel uh, in and around, on this base and in and around London um, as well. And when the bunker got decommissioned, obviously it wasn't that top secret, the kids knew about it, uh, they asked the, uh, the uh, camp uh, commandant for permission to come down here and, uh, and ha hold a Halloween party. This is part of the, uh, the decor for that, as indeed are the cobwebs. So lest you think there is a vast colony of tarantulas living down here, um, the cobwebs down there... Um, off from that party too, and that's indicative if you're an uh, environmentalist in mind how long plastic survives. So that's from the mid 90s, and it looks exactly the same as it did when it got put up in terms of spider webs. So uh, there we go. Um, we're going to push on down through that door down there, um, and if you can look really closely, it says uh, TS security clearance required for entry into that room. What might TS stand for? Top secret. Top secret. So let's go and have a look. back round into this one? No, probably not. It's just a big long room. We're not coming back round into this one now. Um, I could run down to the bottom quickly as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers mate, thanks. Oops. I'm going to quick run down yet. These are the cobwebs he was talking about. Does he go much further? Does it go much further? Are we going to meet them back up if we go around here? Yeah, there's some people down there, look. There they are. I should have had a good look. How about this bit? We're coming down here in a bit. I'm not sure if we can really bring you back around. Okay, cool. How are we doing? Thanks. Are we coming back around this way, down yeah, there? Yeah, we're going to go through that way, don't cool. you worry. Cool. Thanks a lot. No, no, make sure Cheers. everyone sees as much as possible. That's the point of the tour. So, we come through the door that says TS, Top Secret Clearance Required. So again, another Holy of Holies and even more reinforced and um, secure in here. Um, various magnetic tape switches. Some people have said that when um, the crews missile system was deployed to the UK. Um, I think Green and Common Women, all of that, cruise missiles, all the furore that that caused in the 1980s, but the command and control system was going to be from here. I, I've seen people say that. I've also seen people say that it was never installed here, so I don't know, but um, I suspect this might have been the room for it. Certainly what this room was used for, again, as you see above the uh, top secret sign on the other side of the door, was this was the WWMCCS room or WIMIX, uh, as it was uh, pronounced rather than uh, spelt out as an acronym, which stands for the Worldwide Military Command and Control System. Um, 
It was a system brought in after the Cuban Missile Crisis when it became absolutely apparent that in the Cold War you would get these flashpoints, these moments of crisis, when timely information up the chain and down the chain was absolutely critical. There was no point in trying to go through switchboards and spend hours kind of place calls from here to the coast and then transatlantic. We needed really quick um, uh, communications. Um, both, as I say, for units on the ground to pass message, pass messages and for it to come down. And there, there was a, a tendency in any big organisation and bureaucracy to cause delays. Well, I'm not going to pass this down the chain until I've spoken to the Admiral. So I'll wake the Admiral up. Yeah, pass it down to, uh, to regional headquarters. Right, I'll pass it down to regional headquarters. Right, I've got to wake the, the Vice Commodore up. Oh, okay. Um, all of this takes time. You needed really quick uh, responses. And that's what Wimix was meant to, uh, to introduce. Um, it didn't really work. Uh, as a lot of big IT projects, um, uh, even this day, um, it, it didn't particularly work. And a case in point was the um, incident with their ship called the USS Liberty in the 1967 Six Day War. Um, the USS Liberty, an American ship, an electronic warfare ship, so an eavesdropping ship, listening in to the Israelis, the Egyptians, the Syrians, and finding out what was going on by listening into their communication transmissions, uh, got quite close to the, um, to the Israeli coast. And it was decided by the Joint Chiefs that actually there was a danger of the ship getting attacked. It could be regarded as a provocation from a country that was ostensibly neutral uh, in the conflict. Uh, and it, and it, should, it should move away from the, um, from the, uh, from the uh, fighting. Uh, two messages were sent, uh, one of which took 13 hours to reach the actual ship. Um, and, and ultimately, it arrived too late. Uh, the Israeli Air Force spotted the ship. They, they mistook it for, uh, for an Egyptian vessel and they attacked it, uh, severely damaged it. A number of sail US sailors were killed. And this is ostensibly by Israel, uh, an ally of um, the United States. Uh, and that just highlighted this need for a, for a worldwide command and control system. Now, you can read about the Liberty incident yourself, all sorts of conspiracy theories. Did the Israelis attack it deliberately? I, I doubt it. But again, that's a, that's a historical rabbit hole that you can disappear down on the internet uh, in your own time. As I say, Wimix was brought in to prevent that kind of situation, but it never really happened. In organisations like the Army, Navy, Air Force, the Central Intelligence Agency, organisations for whom secrecy is a stock in trade, sharing of information is something that is to be shied away from as far as many uh, internal people are concerned. Um, to this day, I, I believe there are something like 160 different computer systems and networks across the Department of Defence, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines and the Central Intelligence Agency. All people who should be working absolutely hand in glove together for the security and coordination of, in this case, the United States of America. So 160 different computer networks. There we go. Um, as I say, the battle between compartmentalisation and security versus access to the information and actually making use of it is, is an age-old an age-old issue in, uh, in terms of spying and secrecy. And to reinforce that, what we've got is a room at the back there which uh, has a sign on it saying above ground classified storage. Again, slightly enigmatic, I can't tell you any more than uh, what the sign itself says. Right, so we're going to make our way into uh, the corridor here. There are a couple of rooms with bullet holes in. We're going to have a look at those in a moment and we'll go into the uh, big room. I'll be so quick. Bang in your head. Surprising they had this low stuff in a room that was being so heavily used. That's very low for an in use room. I just wanted to get the sign on the back of the door. Restricted area, WM, WWM CCS. Halon protected as well. <coughs> Cheers, man. Thanks. Oh, anything exciting? Just a sign on the door. Just a sign, oh dear. <laughs> WWM CCS, no, there's nothing in there. Right. Okay, now 
Now, remember, this is a 1980s bunker. This has been refurbished from its World War II specs. And the two bunkers operated in very different ways. In the World War II bunker, you'd have had the classic operations room, or plotting room, as it's sometimes called, at the heart of any command and control bunker. British, American, German, Army, Navy, Air Force, everyone wanted, you've all seen it in the film, the Battle of Britain, and things like that. So a great big plotting table where groups of men and women before Anything in here? would push croupier sticks with it's markers for ships and aircraft. Oh, really it's right, yeah. Air, sea, land, whatever it may be. Um, often almost with a, with a mezzanine level or a balcony so that senior officers could get up there, get the bird's eye view, right, there's a threat building in the east, we need to counter that, okay, make a call, send the troops over there. Uh, and that was the case here, and that's because in a non-computer age, things had to be done physically. Big paper files and filing cabinets, people physically moving map, uh, markers on a map because you didn't have computer screens and great big TVs and uh, holographic displays and all sorts of stuff like that. And roughly around about here, lost unfortunately to the 1980s refurb, would have been um, the, the, the plotting room or the command and control centre. Again on two levels, because absolutely there was a mezzanine level, so that would have been in what is now the top floor of the bunker, and you would have been able to look into what was a huge two-storey space. So the ceiling would have gone above this into the ceiling of the floor above. So you had a huge great hall here effectively, and imagine the windows at a mezzanine level somewhere um, over there. To help picture the scene, I will now show you a couple of pictures. These are the only two photographs I've ever seen of the inside of the bunker, and even then, um, they're not necessarily attributed. So this one here um, shows three senior officers, all general officers of the US Air Force, looking at a number of photographs. And the man standing here is a photo interpretation officer who gets all the pictures taken over enemy territory and goes, right, what we're looking at here is a forest, but notice these tracks, notice these camouflage nets. We've identified this as a V2 rocket site. So again, it's the job of the reconnaissance and uh, photo interpretation people to work out what they're seeing. Probably late 1944, early 1945, possibly kind of Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes Forest, that kind of, um, that kind of time. Uh, a couple of the guys have been ID'd, um, so I know that we have uh, General Carl Spatz, Commander of the US Strategic Air Forces in Europe, and beside him, Jimmy Doolittle himself, by that point the Commander of the Mighty Eighth Air Force. So uh, there's Jimmy Doolittle, there is uh, Spatz uh, there. Lots of maps, lots of photographs. This is attributed as being in the plotting room here, but unfortunately there's not enough uh, architecture to be able to confirm that, but I suspect... Show you which one was Doolittle there? That one there. Okay, thanks. It's the one sat down with the bald head. And on the other side, taken around about 1976, again, is this plotting room. So this is right at the end of the first Cold War phase. They're still pretty much using the plotting room uh, for its original purpose, but they have started to bring in computer equipment, which ultimately, in the 1980s refurb, they completely changed the room, put the floor in, and now we can't really uh, picture it, except by looking at that. It's slightly grainy, apologies for that. Yeah. And I think you are facing that way. The mezzanine level up there, so again, in quiet, yeah. calm, um, atmosphere, senior officers can look down upon the plotting table, make their decisions. Here it would all be a hubbub, phones ringing, right, yeah, move the battleship USS Missouri to <laughs> Sector G3 or whatever, right, somebody pushes it on the uh, on the table. Huge maps around the, uh, the wall as well. The table is gone in this photograph because obviously someone has seen fit to take a photograph, so everything secret has been removed, the bunker has been stripped out, and it's only a few years away from, uh, from being refurbished. So, I will pass those around, and you can have a look at that. Um, I've also got some quotes from uh, service personnel that were stationed here, just to give you a kind of a, a flavour for what the, the people in the bunker were, uh, were thinking. And this first quote is from Staff Sergeant Prentice Ollis, proper American name there, uh, stationed here between 1953 and 1956, so fairly early in the Cold War history of the bunker. I won't do the accent. Um, we had some of the best communications facilities available at that time. We had high frequency radio contact to just about any place on earth. Our telephones were remarkable for that time in history. We could pick up the phone and ask for any place in the world <coughs> and be connected almost immediately. We were. Yep. We were in an American bunker yep. in Omaha, Nebraska. And we went down there and they asked us where we were from. Was there any bases near us? And we told them this, we were near this one. And yeah, within, with that quick... They got in touch with this Doors Hill and asked them what the weather yep. was like, was it? 
Because in that, that, that you, you have to place a call. You speak to the operator and say, I'd like to call Nebraska. And they go, OK, we'll place it. And it would take 30 minutes, 60 minutes for all those operators to connect yeah. those uh, switchboards and make the call. So that was unique. These days we are so used to doing that with our mobile phones. <laughs> um, there were huge plotting boards covered with world maps with all types of intelligence information plotted. These plotting boards were 20 to 25 feet high. There's clearly no, no floor here. Uh, and 30 to 40 feet long. There were ladders attached to a rail mounted to the ceiling and they could be slid into position, again to enable them to go up there and, uh, and, and make changes. I recall a very interesting map of the Soviet Union and they were building a railroad to the east across Siberia. Every few days someone would come in and mark the number of cross ties, sleepers, uh, that had been laid in the last 24 hours. Um, again, that just gives you an indication, a nerve centre, intelligence information, Probably not from satellites, we're too early for that, but from other sources, uh, overflights, think Gary Powers and U-2 aircraft overflying, agents on the ground, all that information coming here to give a picture of what the enemy were up to. As I say, it was lost in the 1980s um, refurb. Um, the Reagan era had big, big spending plans. They brought cruise missiles to the UK. Uh, and the bunker, which, as I say, had been mothballed since 1976 when that photo was taken, uh, was referred basically between 1986 and 1989. So no hot war at the time. They could spend a little bit more time bringing it online. $13 million was uh, awarded to McAlpines um, to rebuild it. They converted this operations room. They brought in all the plant equipment into that void that we walked around um, at the beginning. They put the concrete caps on the vent shafts, the big concrete cubes uh, on the surface, and they put the decontamination facility in place. And in fact, the, they also hardened the whole bunker to turn it into a giant Faraday cage. Physicists amongst you will know that um, when a nuclear explosion goes off in the atmosphere for an airburst, the electromagnetic pulse that it gives off in addition to the heat and the light and the other energy uh, will fry complex circuitry and things like that. There's plenty of complex circuitry in here, uh, but in a, in, a, in a science lab you can work inside a Faraday cage to protect equipment from um, EMP, electromagnetic pulses. The whole bunker is effectively one huge Faraday cage, so you can still work with your telephones and computers, even if the invisible energy is uh, frying everything uh, up above ground. Again, that costs money. A further $33 million um, was spent on the computer and communications equipment inside that Faraday cage. And that's when it became the United States Air Force European Theatre of War headquarters. Um, ironically, that refurbishment was completed in 1989. Um, exactly um, well, the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, we are uh, celebrating right now, and it's 1989 that that happened. Well, that's effectively when we date the end of the Cold War from. So the bunker came online uh, just a few months before the fall of the Soviet bloc. All those millions of dollars spent, ultimately to no real uh, effect. But there we go, that was the Cold War. Um, it had three years of use, uh, as, as we saw the final collapse of the Soviet Union, which took place in 1992, and in 1993 uh, it was essentially decommissioned. Uh, the United States Air Force handed the bunker over to the Navy, who said, yeah, we want a motor pool, we need someone to park vehicles, and by the way, the Marines want to smash the hell out of somewhere. Uh, so ultimately it's the Department of the Navy that ended up with final responsibility of the bunker uh, before it was returned to, uh, to British use. So, well, that's it for this floor. Um, Ian, if you wanted to stand in the corridor there, normally I would give people a, a bit of time just to look at the rooms next door, where there's more bullet holes, if you want that. There are loos at the other end, but ultimately there's a staircase up to the, um, up to the third and final floor. So, just so you don't all get lost, but if you do want to have a look at that room there. So are you suggesting working loos? Because normally people don't like them. Sadly like, not working. No, you, be, you better really tell them that. They're going to crap in them otherwise. <laughs> So where are we supposed to be going? Um, it's just, it's just, just these ways going around that way. Right. Ah, oh, right. That's the room okay, we just... Okay, there's the staircase. Why don't we just... There's smash holes there, look. Any bullet holes. Cheers. 206207. Top secret clearance required. Let's have a quick look around the end. Let's have a quick look in here. Room 201. Not a lot in here. 
just trunking. Okay. Not much down here, is there? No, it's just the toilets. Just the toilets. Yeah. Right. Oh, so we've come up the floor floor now. I was just changing the battery. We just come in through that doorway. Oh, this looks interesting. This is security door couriers. You're responsible for checking your traffic before departing the service window. Well, look, this looks interesting on the floor. All the ceilings come down. You are leaving a SCI. Okay. So, once again, we were downstairs in the plotting room, the, uh, the old World War II and early Cold War heart of the facility. And unfortunately, I'm not sure, but the presence of these two massive concrete walls left and right of me would lead me to say, as I said downstairs, that this is probably, we'd be floating in midair in the great big plotting room hall. And that would be the ceiling of the plotting room, which we'd be looking at from the floor below. The mezzanine level, I think, somewhere over there, looking down into this big hall, uh, of which we're in the, uh, the upper reaches of, of here. Uh, in the 1980s bunker, it was turned into a communications hub. So this is where all of those uh, radio messages, those telephone calls, the telexes, all the coded information would come in from around the world to this communications centre. Uh, and then be dispatched by runners to other parts of the bunker, I don't know, maybe telephoned onwards, or even given to a courier on a motorbike who would then race across ground to deliver a sealed envelope to a general somewhere else um, in, the, um, in the country. The sign to your warn us, certainly on this side of the door in any case, that you are leaving an SCIF, a uh, secure compartmented information facility. Do not discuss SCI, do not remove SCI. Parting, turning your visitor So uh, again, this is where you could lock the door. Uh, people couldn't just accidentally wander in here. If you needed to pass parcels across, you would do, do so across the counter here. And again, you don't want people peeking. Close, close the window, um, etc. And again, the couriers that would be regular visitors to this patch are warned. Couriers, you are responsible for checking your traffic before departing the service window. If you don't know the address of the person you're giving it to, then now is the time to ask, not when you're on your motorbike halfway to, uh, to London and you suddenly realize you don't know where to go. Slightly more prosaic, because every office is the same all around the globe, there is a little uh, typed sellotape sign here to the wall saying, effective immediately, tile pullers will not, underlined, be loaned to anyone without a signed hand receipt. Sergeant Angel. So obviously he got bored of <laughs> handing out his tile pullers to allow people to pull up the tiles to get to the cable runs underneath, and they didn't return the tile pullers. So <laughs> poor old Sergeant Angel fighting a, a bureaucratic battle. There. <laughs> now, this is a slightly damper end of the bunker, partly because, not because we're deeper, you'd expect it to be damper the deeper you go, but actually we're closer to the surface here, this being the top floor of the bunker, so the damp is beginning to pervade. We're near the emergency exit. Unfortunately, a lot of the ceiling tiles have uh, come down before we But in its day, it was an absolutely vital nerve centre of uh, communications. And again, I've got another quote from another serviceman working in here. Now, this is from a chap called Bob Muir, another Air Force veteran. He served here a little bit later than our Prentice Thomas. He was here in 1966 to 1974. I was with the 485th Communications Squad at the 7th Air Division Headquarters at HWAS, I was the I worked as a radio operator at the start of my call there and had voice contact with the Strategic Air Command Airborne Command Post over their looking glass when it flew over the UK area. My job in the bunker was as a technical controller which maintained the teletype and ran the line circuits. Watch out, there is a hole in the floor okay. over there. Exciting but tension filled time for a young guy first time away from home. 
Yeah. Teenagers, youngsters, put into you know, quite extraordinary situations and uh, places of high security in here. Right, we're almost at the end of the communication centre. It's a remote communication terminal center. card reader processor. Again, a poster from the Property Services Agency, the very final administrators of the bunker, the PSA, the branch of the civil service, the UK civil service, that deals with the disposal or the purchase of um, government property. So when they came here and they whacked up their PSA poster, you'll see one remaining health and safety poster at the end. And then we'll go through uh, another airlock. Um, notice all the um, heavy lifting kit. Uh, which is above the trap doors which descend through the floors of the bunker. So again, pallet loads of computers and furniture can be winched up and down through the bunker. And we'll come out where that emergency um, ladder was. Remember we saw that in the void disappearing up into the darkness. But we're going to look at the top end of that. I mean, yeah, a bit smelly as well. Lots of black, black, black spores on the walls. The, uh, these are bulging out with damp. Look at that little white spores there, look. White spores stuff. It's unusual, different, uh, different material on the air. Uh, don't normally see air, air filters like that. <coughs> Comsex custodian. Cheers. Thank you. Crossing across the corridor. PSA. Daylight, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, for YouTube. Yeah. Uh, beast of the door, it took three of us just now. Obviously, yeah. Those just coming through, you yeah. stood there on that yeah, metal trapdoor, which the there's three successive trapdoors, so you can then facilitate winching through that electric winch of all the stores and equipment and pallets down to the. Uh, Second and lower floors as well. A winch there as well. And as you come through the door here, you've got on top of the, uh, the emergency escape ladder that we saw the foot of. The electric cable is wound up, wound up onto this. Yeah. You can see why it's a bit damper in that room, just because we are close to the surface of moisture. You can come down here. Yeah. The uh, seals. Morning. Do not. Uh, in terms of getting kits and equipment down here, the staircase that we use, you can't really handle pallets and things like that. So what you have here on the surface is a winch at the top, and you have a kind of like a sledge or pallet. Air yeah, filters to coming in from the side. Slowly winch on a dolly truck, hence the rails left and right, either side of the steps here, and that dolly truck can then be bolted here. You've got another electric winch. 
is the emergency ladder from the lower area. You here, it can then be uh, winch tied to the top of the uh, plant void there where the ladder goes down, or you unhitch it, move it across into the airlock, and again you can see that second electrical winch which takes you down the inside of the uh, drilling parts of the bunker. Right. We're going to make our way up the stairs for freedom. There is a handrail if you can find it on the wall, so feel free to use that. There's the controls for the winch system there. The winch, which comes all the way along, all the way along this corridor here. Some sort of emergency alarm. And this is the rails, the railway going to the surface so they could um, bring stuff down. A trolley, a trolley winch. Yeah, rails, up, rails on this each side for a, for a train. Yeah. <laughs> well, you want to catch the view back there? That's pretty good, isn't it? This is the walk back up to the surface. So, and we've got the rails on the left and on the right, so they actually winch stuff down. I've seen that in a few bunkers, but narrower, narrower winching, stuff like that. But you wouldn't want to be at the bottom when, when that thing let go. We've got some of the, got some winching equipment here. It might actually be a spring, a spring loading, spring loading for emergency. So it would take up the, take up the, um, the jolts if something jolted. You can see the, the rail has actually come off here. Yeah. Rails come, come free. Look. Without, oops. Up on the surface. Ooh. Let's have a look at these bits for you then, before we go, one last look, it's interesting, I'm going to clip you something onto. See the rails on the way out. Intercom, and that's the view back in. We got we had some uh, winch controls here, like controlling a trolley in and down. The sensors and the actual uh, winch cables as we come out by here. Well, made it out. Made it out alive. Didn't get. Didn't get my. Uh, didn't get my SD card. Secret vault. Okay. Um, I'm going to catch what he's got to say. Um, Wickham Abbey School Bursa at the time got wind of that planning application, and it was the school that was responsible for contacting English Heritage to say, look. It's on our property, but we think this is absolutely unique and it should be preserved. And it's thanks to the efforts of the school, and specifically the school Bursa, um, that English Heritage got involved. And ultimately, um, in 2014, the bunker was awarded a Grade 2 star listing status. Um, it is unique just in architectural uh, terms because of the double skin bunker, but in terms of what it represents, the, the friendly invasion, World War II, the tensions of the, uh, of the Cold War, uh, as I say, it is an extremely important group.
Uh, again, it's thanks to the school that we are here. Clearly, it is not term time. There are no girls here, otherwise we wouldn't be able to do the tours. Uh, the last thing we would want is members of the public to access the school here. Parents wouldn't be too happy with that. Uh, so this is taking place in holiday time. Um, the school are currently considering, uh, after this experiment of this and a, a previous tour a couple of months ago, whether to do this more frequently. So hopefully, watch this space, and uh, if we do do it more often, tell friends and family the same website where you bought your tickets on behalf of the school from will be the place where that is advertised. So thank you for your time and attention, and I think on behalf of uh, myself and you guys, we should say thank you to Ian, to Claire, and the rest of the guys from the school for letting us have a look at the bunker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just to add to the end of it, that's the end of the tour now, so if your vehicles are parked here, please drive them, speed limit is 20 miles an hour on all of the site. If your vehicles are parked at the bottom of the hill in what we call Lime Avenue, can you please make sure that you stay on the concrete, on the tarmac road, and, and exit straight away down through there. There's no more milling around for now, please, if can that's okay. Can we go back to the toilet? Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. <laughs> we can park on the tour in 30 minutes, hence the need to try and free the car parking space because uh, there isn't that much of it here, especially at the top of the hill. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am, yes. Just curious, I was down for tomorrow, <laughs> but um, that, that got cancelled and I got pushed back no, no, to no, today. No, no. Did uh, they, uh, they cancelled it, today. So, yeah. Was it because it wasn't enough numbers oh, or something? No. I still actually um, do so. Just people couldn't yeah, run it. There was a reason for it, I can't think of it. You didn't have, numbers, a, didn't have the staff have a waiting on. list for this, so. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was quite popular. It's been booked out, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Within days, actually. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks for your, thanks for your time. No, no Cheers, mate. On this one, so when will it be on YouTube? Oh, well, as soon as I can get my arse into gear, which for this one will probably be quite. So I've just been told by the head of security here that he was happy to see me along and uh, he's actually driving in the security car behind me now. So, um, yeah, but he said he's happy, happy for me to have come and hopes I enjoyed myself. I did say. I, I could have come a couple of months ago and avoided all the uh, avoided all the angst, and I'd just take my video down then. But anyway, there we are. We've done it now, so I don't know if this is the way out. But um, I think I'm getting the guided. Uh, I'm getting the, the. You know, he's making sure that I I come out. Look, there he is. There he is. He's disappearing off in his security car. Look. Uh, <laughs> there he is. But uh, bless him. And the security guy who apparently spotted me. <laughs> I just gave him a wave because apparently that guy spotted me straight away and knew uh, knew who I was <laughs> in the, in the um, you know the gatehouse, the guardhouse. So apparently when I turned up, he, he, he's like, "Matt Williams is here, he's here, he's here." So they're like, "Matt Williams is on the site. Matt Williams has entered the building." So uh, yeah, apparently then. Uh, they knew I was coming, surely, because I didn't use a false name on the uh, the forms. So um, yeah, it was good. It was good, but I would have liked a little bit more time. Um, what I will say, as a suggestion to the people that are running it, because people like myself, we are into photography, and I'm gonna have to put this phone down in a second. But let's see if I can do it a, a nicer way. So let me just put this phone on here without turning it off. There we go. All good now drive hands-free but um, here's a message for the people who run it and this is a positive suggestion for you it'll be a lot less aggro and you'll get more money out of it people like myself would be prepared to pay a lot more money to have a slightly more private tour okay and then that means you've got to have less people watching what people are doing now what they do at Drake Low Drake Low um, Underground is it's about 40, 45 pounds, yeah? And then you get four or five hours to take photos, yeah? So there's less people, but they're paying more money. And then it requires less staff, but it's for people who are more interested in photography. So you've got two types of people. You've got the types of people who just want a tour, and they were there. Those people were there just wandering around, taking the occasional photo. And then you've got the people like myself who've got the bigger cameras or video equipment and they want to take a lot of photos. You know, to them it's very important to document it really pro properly and it's hard to do in a short space of time. So those sorts of people would be prepared to pay more money, yeah, um, 
it's worth thinking about. It's worth thinking about so you could have less staff to walk around with them and you could basically let them uh, let them wander off. But you know, just a thought. Um, because it was a little bit cramped and it, you know it, it I don't think it looks quite so much uh, quite so fun with lots of people you know in the shot when you're wandering around it's better to kind of like smoothly slowly walk around with nobody in front of you and that's kind of good for my um, that's kind of good for my my sort of thing so yeah but uh, yeah they, they were nice people nice people they did know I know who I was um, I did hear that somebody was like behind me slagging me off, but hey, they didn't stop me coming in. That's the main thing. Slag me off, slag me off all day long, folks. I'm used to it. I get a lot of that. So uh, yeah, but thanks for watching, and um, don't forget they'll be doing more of these tours there. So keep an eye out on the internet if you want to go and have a look. Um, check out the internet. Sign up. See if they've got some sort of like uh, notifications list. So, Secret Vault signing out. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. This concrete thing, look. It's a raised manhole. The hell, so why would you need that there? Look at this big um, concrete block that's built on. Here we go. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, uh. I can hear some form of electric. I think there's probably going to be security down here in a minute now. Oh, here we go. Hello there. Delete any photos you've taken. Um, rather not. It's alright. We've got to see where we can get out here now without the police getting us. It's an old, uh, they backfilled something. Oh no, no. Hang on. Oh no, they. Metal, metal doors. Wire. Way up. Sounds like there's people in there. This goes different directions as well. Oh, what does it? Oh, hello. It's gonna be a big room. Oh yes. It's actually got one of those glass lifts. One of those um, cameras that radios, radios back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to go to a cheeky one. This is exploring with umbrellas. Fire escape.